Hi, fourth graders. Welcome back to Miss Grant's Read Aloud. Uh, thank you for everyone who listened yesterday. And shout out to Corey for answering the three questions. Awesome job, Corey. We're gonna be uh, we're gonna begin reading chapter two today of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer of Stone by J.K. Rowling. All right. So yesterday we left off with Dumbledore and Professor McGonagall leaving Harry. Baby Harry on the woo, so sorry on the steps of the Dudleys. So, Chapter Two: The Vanishing Glass. Nearly ten years had passed since the Dursleys had woke up to find their nephew on their front step, but Privet Drive had hardly changed at all. The sun rose in the same tidy front garden and lit up the brass numbers number four on the Dursleys' front door. It crept into the living room, which was almost exactly the same as it had been on the night when Mr. Mr. Dursley had seen that fateful news report about the owls. Only the photographs and the mantelpiece really showed how much time had passed. Ten years ago, there had been lots of pictures of what looked like a large pink beach ball wearing different colored bonnets. But Dudley Dursley was no longer a baby. And now the photograph showed a large blonde boy riding his first bicycle on a carousel at the fair, and playing a computer game with his father, being hugged and kissed by his mother, too. The room held no sign at all that another boy lived in that house. Yet, Harry Potter was still there, asleep at the moment, but not for long. His Aunt Petunia was awake, and, in her sh uh, in it, <laughs> and it was her shrill voice that made the first noise of the day. Get up! Get up! Now! Get up! Harry woke with a start. His aunt rapped on the door again. Up, she screeched. Harry heard her walking towards the kitchen, and then the sound of the frying pan being put on the stove. He rolled onto his back and tried to remember the dream he had. He was having. It had been a good one. There he had been flying, uh, been in a flying motorcycle. It had a funny feeling that he'd had the same dream before. His aunt uh, was back outside the door. Are you up yet? She demanded. Nearly, said Harry. Well, get a move on. I want you to look after the bacon, and don't you dare let it burn. I want everything perfect on Dudley's birthday. Harry groaned. What did you say? His aunt snapped through the door. Nothing, nothing. Dudley's birthday. How could I have forgotten? Harry got slowly out of bed and started looking for some socks. He found a pair under his bed, and after pulling a spider off one of them, put them on. Harry was used to spiders because the cupboard underneath the stairs was full of them, and that's where he slept. When he was all dressed, he went down to the hall into the kitchen. The table was almost hidden beneath all of Dudley's birthday presents. It looked as though Dudley had gotten the new computer he wanted. Not to mention the second television and the racing bike. Exactly why Dudley wanted a racing bike was a mystery to Harry, as Dudley was very fat and hated exercise. Dudley's favorite punching bag was Harry, but he could often he couldn't often catch him. Harry didn't look look it, but he was very fast. Perhaps it was something to do with living in a dark cupboard, but Harry had always been small and skinny for his age. He looked even smaller and skinnier than he really was because he had all uh, because all he had to wear were old clothes of Dudley's, and Dudley was four times bigger than he was. Harry had a thin face, knotty knees, black hair, and bright green eyes. He wore round glasses held together with lots of scotch tape because all the times Dudley had punched him in the nose. The one thing Harry liked about his own appearance was his very thin scar on his forehead that, uh, that was shaped like a lightning bolt. He had, he had had it uh, as long as he could remember, and the first question he could re ever remember asking his Aunt Petunia was how he had gotten it. In a car crash when your parents died, she had said, and don't ask questions. Don't ask questions was the first rule for a, quiet li for a quiet life with the Dursleys. Uncle Vernon entered the kitchen as Harry was turning over the bacon. Comb your hair, he barked the way by the way of the morning greeting. About once a week, Uncle Vernon looked over the top of his newspaper and shouted that Harry needed a haircut. Harry must have had more haircuts than the rest of the boys in his class put together, but it made no difference. His hair simply grew that way, all over the place. Harry was frying eggs by the time Dudley arrived in the kitchen with his mother. Dudley 
looked a lot like Uncle Vernon. He had a large pink face, not much neck, small, watery blue eyes, and thick blonde hair that lay smooth on his thick, fat head. Aunt Petunia often said that Dudley looked like a baby angel. Harry often said that Dudley looked like a pig in a wig. Harry put the plate of eggs and bacon on the table, which was difficult, as there wasn't much room. Dudley, meanwhile, was continuing, uh, was counting his presence. His face fell. Thirty-six, he said, looking up at his mother and father. That's two less than last year. Darling, you haven't counted Aunt Mar uh, Auntie Marge's present? See, it's, it's under the, this big one from Mommy and Daddy. All right, thirty-seven then said Dudley, going red in the face. Harry, who could see a uh, who could see a huge Dudley tantrum coming on, began wolfing down his bacon as fast as possible, in case Dudley turned the table over. Aunt Petunia obviously scented danger, too, because she said quickly, And we'll buy you another two presents while we're out today. How's that, pumpkin? Two more presents? Is that all right? Dudley thought for a moment. It looked like hard work. Finally, he said slowly, so I'll have 30, 30, 39 sweetums, said Petunia. Oh, Dudley sat down heavily and grabbed the nearest parcel. All right, then. Uncle Vernon chuckled. Little tyke, he wants his money's worth just like his father. Attaboy, Dudley, he ruffled Dudley's hair. At that moment, the telephone rang, and Aunt Petunia went to answer it, while Harry and Uncle Vernon watched Dudley unwrap the racing bike, video camera, remote control airplane, 16 new computer games, and a VCR. He was ripping the paper off a gold wrist, wrist watch when Aunt Petunia came back from the telephone, looking both angry and worried. Bad news, Vernon said. Mrs. Figgs broke, has broken her leg. She can't take him. She jerked her head in Harry's direction. Dudley's mouth fell open in horror, but Harry's heart gave a leap. Every year on Dudley's birthday, his parents took him and his friends out for the day to an adventure park, hamburger restaurant, or the movies. Every year, Harry was left behind with Mrs. Figgs, a mean or a mad old lady who lived two streets away. Harry hated it there. The whole house smelled of cabbage, and Mrs. Figg made him look at the photographs of all the cats she had ever owned. Now what? said Aunt Petunia, looking furiously at Harry as though he'd planned this. Harry knew he ought to feel sorry for Mrs. Fig and ha that ha Mrs. Fig had a broken leg, but it wasn't easy when he was reminded of himself it would be a whole year before he had to look at Tibble, Snowy, Mr. Paw, and Tufty again. We could phone Marge, Uncle Vernon suggested. Don't be silly, Vernon. She hates that boy. The Dursleys often spoke about Harry like this, as though he wasn't there, or rather as though he was something very nasty that couldn't understand them, like a slug. What about, what's her name, your friend Yvonne? On vacation, snapped Aunt Petunia. You could just leave me here, Harry put in a, in a hopefully he'd be able to watch what he wanted on television for a change, and maybe he'd even go on Dudley's computers. Aunt Petunia looked as though she'd swallowed a lemon. And come back and find the house in ruins? She snarled. I won't blow this house up, said Harry. But they weren't listening. I suppose we could take him to the zoo, said Aunt Petunia slowly. And leave him in the car. That's a new car. He's not sitting in it alone. Dudley began to cry loudly. In fact, he wasn't really crying. It has been years since he'd really cried. But he knew if that's. Uh, but he knew that if he screwed his face up and wailed, his mother would give him anything he wanted. Dinky duddy dums, don't cry, mummy won't let you. Uh, won't let him spoil your special day. She cried, flinging her arms around him. I don't want him to come! Yelled Dudley, between two huge, pretend swab sobs. He always spoils everything. He shot in Harry a nasty grin through the gaps of his mother's arms. Just then, the doorbell rang. Oh, good lord. They're here, said Aunt Petunia frantically, and a moment later, Dudley's best friends, Piers Polkis, walked in with his mother. Piers was a scrawny boy with a face like a rat, and he was usually the one who held people's arms behind their back while Dudley hit them. 
Dudley stopped pretending to cry at once. Half an hour later, Harry, who couldn't believe his luck, was sitting in the back of the Dursley's car with Piers and Dudley on the way to the zoo for the first time in his life. His aunt and uncle hadn't been able to think of anything else to do with him, but before they had left, Uncle Vernon had taken Harry aside. I'm warning you, he said, putting his large purple face right up close to Harry's. I'm warning you now, boy. Any funny business, anything at all, and you'll be up in that cupboard from now until Christmas. I'm not going to do anything, said Harry, honestly. But Uncle Vernon didn't believe him. No one ever did. The problem was what uh, the problem was. Strange things often happened around Harry, and it was just no telling the Dursleys. Uh, and, and it was just no good telling the Dursleys he didn't make them happen. Once Aunt Petunia, tired of Harry's coming back from the barber, looking as though he hadn't been there at all, had taken a pair of scissors and cut his hair so short he had almost been bald, except for his bangs, which she left to hide the horrible scar. Dudley laughed himself silly at Harry, who spent a sleepless night imagining school the next day, where he was already laughed at for his baggy clothes and taped glasses. Next morning, however, he had gotten up to find his hair exactly how it had been, how it had been before Aunt Petunia had sheared it off. It had, been given, it had been given a week in his cupboard for this, even though he had tried to explain that he couldn't explain how it had grown back so quickly. Another time, Aunt Petunia had been trying to force him into a, re a revolting old sweater of Dudley's, brown with orange puffballs. The harder she tried to pull it over the head, the smaller it seemed to become, until finally it might have fitted a hand puppet, but certainly not Harry. Aunt Petunia had decided it must have shrunk in the wash, and to his great relief, Harry wasn't punished. On the other hand, he had gone into terrible trouble for being found on the roof of the school's kitchen. Dudley's gang had been chasing him as usual, when, as much of Harry's surprise as anyone else's, there, was, uh, there he was sitting on the chimney. The Dursleys had received a very angry letter from Harry's headmistress, telling them Harry had been climbing the school buildings. But all he tried to do, as he shouted at Uncle Vernon through the locked door of his cupboard, was jump behind the big trash cans outside the kitchen doors. Harry supposed that the wind must have caught him in mid-jump. But today, nothing was going to go wrong. It was, even worth be, uh, it was even worth being with Dudley and Pierce to spend the day somewhere he wasn't at school, his cupboard, or Mrs. Fig, Mrs. Fig's cabbage-smelling living room. While he drove, Uncle Vernon complained to Aunt Petunia. He liked to complain about things. People at work, Harry the council, Harry the bank, and Harry were just a few things, just a few of his favorite subjects. This morning, it was motorcycles. Roaring along like maniacs, the young hoodlums, he said, as the motorcycles overtook them. I had a dream about a motorcycle, said Harry, remembering suddenly. It was flying. Uncle Vernon nearly crashed into the car in front of him. He turned right around in his seat and yelled at Harry's face like a gigantic beat with a mustache. Motorcycles don't fly, Dudley and Pierce snickered. I know they don't, said Harry. It was just a dream. But he'd wish he hadn't said anything. If there was one thing that the Dursleys hated even more than his asking questions, it was his talking about anything, acting in the way he shouldn't, no matter if it was a dream or even in a cartoon. They seemed to think he might just get a dangerous idea. It was a very sunny Saturday, and the zoo was crowded with families. The Dursleys bought Dudley and Pierce large chocolate ice creams at the entrance. And then, because the smiling lady in the van had asked Harry what they wanted before he could hurry him away, they bought him a cheap lemon ice pop. It wasn't bad, either, Harry thought, licking it as they watched the gorilla scratching its head, who looked remarkably like Dudley, except it wasn't blonde. Harry had the best morning he had had in a long time. He was careful to walk a little ways apart from the, Dudley, uh, the Dursleys, so that Dudley and Pierce, who were standing, starting to get bored with the animals by lunchtime, wouldn't fall back onto their favorite hobby of hitting him. They ate, the zoo, they ate in the zoo restaurant, and when Dudley had a tantrum because the Knickerbocker glory didn't have enough ice cream on top, Uncle Vernon bought him another one, and Harry was allowed to finish the first. Harry felt 
afterwards that he should have known it was all too good to last. After lunch, they went to the reptile house. It was cool and dark in there, with lit windows along the walls. Behind the glass, all sorts of lizards and snakes were crawling and slithering over bits of wood and stone. Dudley and Pierce wanted to see huge poisonous cobra and thick man-crushing pythons. Dudley quickly found that the largest snake in the, in the place, it could have wrapped its body twice around Uncle Vernon's car and crushed it into a trash can. But at that moment, it didn't look like it was in the mood for that. In fact, it was fast asleep. Dudley stood with his nose pressed up against the glass, staring at it, glis uh, staring at its glistening brown coils. Make it move, he whined at his father. Uncle Vernon taped, uh, tapped on the glass, but the snake didn't budge. Do it again, Dudley ordered. Uncle Vernon wrapped the, uh, wrapped the glass smartly with his knuckles, but the snake just snoozed on. This is boring, Dudley moaned. He shuffled away. Harry moved in front of the tank and looked intently at the snake. He wouldn't have been surprised if it had died of boredom. No company except stupid people drumming their fingers on the glass trying to disturb it all day long. It was worse than having, uh, than having a cupboard as a bedroom, where the only visitor was Aunt Petunia hammering on his door to wake you up. At least he got to visit the rest of the house. The snake suddenly opened its beady eyes. Slowly, very slowly, it raised its head until its eyes were level with Harry. It winked. Harry stared. Then he looked quickly around to see if anyone was watching. They weren't. He looked back at the snake and winked too. The snake jerked its head towards Uncle Vernon and Dudley, then raised its eyes to the ceiling. It gave Harry a look that said, quite plainly, I get that all the time. I know, Harry muttered through the glass, though he wasn't sure that the snake could hear him. It must have been really annoying. The snake nodded vigorously. Where do you come from anyways? asked Harry. The snake jabbed its tail at the little sign next to the glass. Harry peered at it. It's a boa constrictor. Brazil. Was it nice there? The boa constrictor jabbed its tail at the sign again, and Harry read on. This species, uh, specimen was bred in the zoo Oh, I see. So you've never been to Brazil. As the snake shook its head, a deafening shout behind Harry made both of them jump. Dudley! Mr. Dursley! Come and look at this snake! You won't believe what it's doing! Dudley came waddling towards them as fast as he could. Out of the way, you, he said, punching Harry in the ribs. Caught by surprise, Harry fell hard on the concrete floor. What came next happened so fast, no one saw how it had happened. One second, Pierce and Dudley were leaning right up close to the glass. The next, they had leapt back with howls of horror. When Harry sat up, in, uh, when Harry sat up and gasped, the glass of the front of the bow constrictor's tank had vanished. The great snake was uncoiling itself rapidly, slithering out onto the floor. People throughout the reptile house screamed and started running for the exits. As the snake slid swiftly past him, Harry could have sworn a low, hissing voice said, Brazil, here I come. Thanks, amigo. The keeper of the reptile house was in shock. But the glass, he kept saying, where did the glass go? The zoo director himself made Aunt Petunia a cup of strong sweet tea while he apologized over and over again. Pierce and Dudley could only gibber. As far as Harry had seen, the snake hadn't done anything, except playfully, uh, except snap playfully at their heels as it passed. But by the time they were all back in Uncle Vernon's car, Dudley was telling them how it nearly bitten his leg off, while Pierce was swearing it had tried to squeeze them to death. But worst of all, for Harry at least, was Pierce calming down enough to say, Harry was talking to it, weren't you, Harry? Uncle Vernon waited until Pierce was safely out of the house before starting on Harry. He was so angry he could hardly speak. He managed to say, Go, cupboard, stay, no meals, before he collapsed into his chair, and Aunt Petunia had run and get him a large brandy. Harry lay in his dark cupboard much later, wishing he had watched, uh, wishing he had watched. 
He didn't know what time it was, and he couldn't be sure the Dursleys were asleep yet. Until they were, he couldn't risk sneaking into the kitchen for some food. He'd lived with the Dursleys almost ten years. Ten miserable years, as long as he could remember. Ever since he had been a baby, and his parents had died in that car crash. He couldn't remember being in the car when his parents had died. Sometimes, when he strained his memory during long hours in the cupboard, he came up with strange vo uh, visions. A blinding flash of green light and burning pains on his forehead. This, he supposed, was the crash, though he couldn't imagine where all of the green light came from. He couldn't remember his parents at all. His aunt and uncle never spoke to them. Of course, he was forbidden to ask questions. Uh, there were no photographs of them in the house. And when he had been younger, Harry had dreamed and dreamed of something unknown relation of coming, of coming to take him away, but it had never happened. The Dursleys were his only family, yet sometimes he thought, or maybe hoped, that the strangers in the street seemed to know him. Very strange strangers they were, too. A tiny man in the violet top had borrowed him. Uh, I'm so, uh, oh. <laughs> a tiny man in a violet top hat had borrowed, bowed to him once while out shopping with Aunt Petunia in Dudley. After asking Harry furiously if he had knew the man, Aunt Petunia had rushed them out of the shop without buying anything. A wild-looking old lady, dressed in all green, had waved merrily at him once on a bus. A bald man in a very long purple coat had actually shaken his hand in the street the other day and walked away without a word. The weirdest thing about all these people was that the way they seemed to vanish the second Harry tried to get closer. At school, <clears throat> at school, Harry had no one. Everyone knew that Dudley's gang hated that odd Harry Potter in his baggy old clothes and broken glasses, and nobody liked to disagree with Dudley's gang. And that is the end of chapter two. We will read chapter three. Mm. We'll read it tomorrow. Yeah, we will read it tomorrow. I do have three questions to ask you. Um, my first question is, what is Dudley's best friend's name? Uh, my second question is, where is the snake, the boa constrictor, originally from? And why, this one you may respond however you like, why do you think all of those people on the streets are waving at Harry or they're trying to get their attention? Like, why do you think they're doing that and, like, who do you think they are? All right, we will read chapter three. We'll read chapter three tomorrow. Thank you for watching, and I will be waiting to hear your responses. Bye.